I have been asked to respond to a prompt based off of a work by Catherine Tanner called On the Working of the Holy Spirit. Two views of the Holy Spirit are contrasted here. One which is unmediated, private, stressing the imminence of the Holy Spirit, our personal walk with the Holy Spirit. Now, the Spirit can directly come upon a believer offering a word or message. While at the same time, what Catherine Tanner refers to as a messier understanding of the Holy Spirit, a God is working through so-called natural processes, God working through reason, God even working through political movements, through discussions, through human agency. The word fallibility is also stressed by Catherine Tanner. On one hand, we see a kind of ultramontanism would be the classical patristic way of viewing this. But uh, Tanner usually refers to the experience of Puritans in the 16th century, of the Spirit of God descending upon a charismatic figure. And we see Puritans describing this experience as a means of rejecting usual understandings of Scripture, church hierarchy, church tradition, and this kind of radical form of personalized experience is also one of deep passion, and we need to respect this kind of profound personal encounter. We see quotations that, you know, if you have someone who's never tasted sugar or salt, how are you to explain it to them? It's a matter of personal experience or flavor, just as someone who can see watching the sun rise, uh, if they see that the sun is rising, then day is day. You could muster all the philosophers and politicians and potentates in the world, but nothing can replace the experience of watching the sunrise or sunset. Uh, having lost my vision uh, at age five and a half, I can definitely attest that uh, it is one thing for me to have this memory of what that was like, and then to try to convey that memory to those friends of mine who were born without uh, physical sight. It would be the equivalent of me trying to explain to them what the color blue or red is while at the same time, the other messier point of view, which can also be easily caricatured pretty quickly. It's interesting that Tanner uh, quotes people like Thomas Hobbes, uh, who describe sanctity as something that could be uh, acquired through education, through learning, through discipline. We already see the inherent bias here. But the idea is that God is working through these processes that we see all around us in nature, through the messiness of human conversation, the messiness of the experience of the world. When a man or woman is made a prophet of God, their humanity isn't stripped away from them. The authors of sacred scripture, as Tanner notes, is, is not removed from them. When Isaiah or Peter or Paul is speaking, it isn't merely the Holy Spirit talking outside of their childhood, their pains, their anguish, and their torments. Instead, the fullness of their humanity comes through. The totality of their humanity comes through. Yet herein lies my question. I have to respond with a question to a work such as this. Tanner views this messier perspective in regards to language suggesting fallibility. And she also is speaking of scripture in some sense as a part of this process that we need to amend to some extent our understanding of scripture in light of our growing understanding of reason. And while this is never explicitly stated in the text, nowhere does she say, okay, well, uh, the Holy Spirit experience of a believer now is the same as a Holy Spirit experience of a author of sacred scripture. She never, never says that. However, there is no distinguishing I could find in the piece. And perhaps I didn't look more closely enough, but having read through it about twice now, um, there is no clear distinction I find between the unique authoritative status of sacred scripture and the inspiration of scripture versus the Holy Spirit experience that we as believers possess now. Now, don't misunderstand me. According to 1 Corinthians, it is very clear to me that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. Within the Roman Catholic world, I could point out miracles such as at Fatima, where indeed uh, messages were given to three children and 
there was a public miracle that was witnessed by over 100,000 people. Uh, within uh, Protestantism, we see the rise of the charismatic phenomena. While there are frauds, not everything is subject to uh, a hoax. There's many real phenomena, uh, some of which I believe I have witnessed. And I believe that there can be experience of legitimate prophecy. Within Eastern Orthodoxy, you have figures such as Elder Paisios, who, like uh, Padre Pio, could bilocate, be in two places at the same time. So in terms of that m immediate, extraordinary form that Tanner references within the Puritanical world, uh, that is very real, along with the natural, messier process. It's a both and, not an either or. And I want to stress that. Much of theology is a both and rather than an either or, in my opinion. On the other hand, we need to recognize that these current experiences, which um, are termed within uh, the Western church often as private revelation or prophetic revelation, rather than public revelation, usually reserved within Catholicism and Orthodoxy to scripture and tradition, and within Protestantism simply to uh, scripture, sola scriptura. Um, that there is a distinguishing factor between these two, between that which is taught as uniquely inspired scripture and that which is our own experience. Now, I would like to add here, I wish I had more time. I would love to add here the reality that terms such as inerrancy are often used to describe the role of scripture. I actually still enjoy using this word. However, it is highly misunderstood. And by this, what is meant uh, in the terms found, for example, in the Second Vatican Council, uh, Dei Verbum, and in the mind, for example, of people like St. Thomas Aquinas, and even in the mind of Martin Luther, what, what this could have meant was a sense that all of Scripture is indeed God-breathed, 2 Timothy 3.16, that in some sense, God is objectively true without error, and therefore God's word is without error. However, at the same time, it is through the agency of human beings within their culture, within their circumstance, within their own day-to-day -day struggles, uh, within their own sufferings, anxieties, and within the limitations, within the limitations of their time. So I don't expect, for example... Uh, the Bible to be a book on physics or on uh, dental hygiene or necessarily to present all the factual information of uh, cosmology necessarily. However, I do expect it to be, uh, to paraphrase one very famous Western theologian, the words of God in the words of men. And I would add here the words of men and women. Now, there should be nothing controversial about that, but uh, terminology such as inerrancy has been hijacked, regrettably, uh, by those who would want to try and turn the Bible into a blueprint for material outside that purview. And it has given the traditional terminology a bad name. And as a result, what we have going on, for example, is a, a desire to move away from this and to perceive scripture um, under different terms. So that could be a, a separate discussion entirely, but the Holy Spirit uniquely spoke to the apostles and prophets in a way that the Holy Spirit uh, perhaps doesn't communicate to us in the same way. And yet, it is still the same Holy Spirit. It is still the same divine third person of the Holy Trinity. And it is still an immediate experience. So I don't think we're going to be adding books to the Bible anytime soon. However, I think the private, that doesn't mean a strictly private, but prophetic utterances of figures such as Lucia at Fatima or uh, their Lutheran charismatic theologians in the 19th and 20th century and even earlier should all be taken very seriously and should be treated as important and authoritative in the same way I would find uh, the work of C.S. Lewis authoritative and important. So these are very interesting categories of thought and very eager to see where they go.